We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Paul from the Sirius Report. Originally a physicist, he was awarded a PhD in biomolecular physics, after which he spent some time working in academia. He then went on to work in the financial services sector and worked in some major banks until the financial crisis of 2008, when he left the banking sector to work in the precious metal sector. Paul, how are you today? Thanks for joining me again. Well, thanks, Tom. It's a pleasure to join you again. We were saying it's been a long time, but yeah, thank you. I much appreciate the opportunity to for us to have a chat about things. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that we spoke about before we hit record here today was this idea that to be able to have the amount of nuance that it really requires to understand a lot of these situations does take, you know, a lot of time and a lot of discussion. Unfortunately, there's so many moving pieces to properly try to understand that it's not just an easy, clickbaity, sexy thing to be able to digest in a two minute block. So I appreciate you taking some time today to be able to help illuminate a lot of these hidden pieces for us. Well, yeah, you make a great point. That's exactly the issue here. And it's becoming more and more the case because obviously the world is so interconnected. But, you know, there's a time when you could sort of divorce things like the economy to some extent from finance and finance from politics and geopolitics. But the world's very small. Every global event now is having an impact across the wider economy, the financial system and and geopolitics. And some very innocuous event could happen somewhere in the world that people would think is irrelevant, but actually is hugely significant in terms of what I keep making this point, this enormous paradigm shift where the world is moving away from what you might term unipolarity to multipolarity. And and it's tracking all those changes, understanding what the implications of those are and why they are significant now and in the future. And so, yeah, it's it, and it is. It's not something you can easily explain in in an hour or five hours or fifty hours. But you know, we can discuss some points, and you know, obviously, we can revisit things in the future to continue that discussion. Mm-hmm. You know, that's exactly where I wanted to start. Is the fact that you have been laying out the case for the multipolar world since well before even the Ukrainian-Russian conflict. So why don't we start by getting a sense of what that change means away from the unipolar world of the past and what it looks like in the future? In a broad sense, it's a kind of recognition. I mean, the West wants the world to continue as it is. I think there are elements now that finally have recognized the traditional unipolarity model has failed. And it's failed for economic reasons for all, you know, since 2008 was the end of unipolarity as far as I was concerned. Okay, they've carried on and and fudged economies, fudged the financial system to try and keep this unipolarity going, which principally revolves around dollar hegemony. But even though they recognize this, they still want the status quo to maintain things the way they are. They don't want things to radically change. They've started to finally accept that the global south has a voice and it's a part of the world we actually have to acknowledge finally that it does exist because in the past when they talked about the world the world was really the west and its satellites so you could include maybe the japanese and the australians and the south koreans and and now of course they're finally going well there is this bigger world and increasingly they're saying we don't think the unipolar world is a just world. It is not served our interests at all. I mean, that revolves around colonialism, for example, and neocolonialism, where Western countries, the British, one of the worst examples of this, went into Africa, for example, and just exploited these countries. We had slavery, and then we have neocolonialism, where they go into these countries, seize control of assets, and the, the country itself maybe benefits 5% from this exploitation, and the rest goes to the West. The French is a classic example in the Sahel region, including nations like Burkina Faso, Niger, etc. And because they've turned around and said, we've had enough of this, and we want to be able to assert our own autonomy, we want to be able to make our own decisions, 
they've kind of realized, well, we can't function in a SWIFT-based system, in a dollar-based world, because the United States has ruthlessly manipulated the dollar and weaponized it against us, because if we do something they don't like, they'll sanction us. And the Ukraine war was a great example of this, where someone made, or a group of people made the most idiotic decision to go, I know, let's sanction Russia's central bank, let's sanction all Russian bank, and let's freeze Russian assets, meaning in dollar terms, in wherever they were in the West, whether it's Euro clear, whether in the United States, doesn't matter. And they looked at this and went, oh, so is that how it is? In the future, if we disagree with you, maybe you'll do that to us. Now, Russia can survive those onerous sanctions simply because it has enormous resource base. It's you know self-sufficient in terms of energy and, and food security. Most nations wouldn't be able to survive that. And that caused a huge schism where there was obviously multipolarity was already in place where nations were starting to want to de-dollarize they wanted to be able to maximize the benefit of resources they had or to have win-win cooperation with other nations but the ukraine war massively accelerated that and it's just fundamentally the idea you know that we want to be on a level playing field we want to be able to exploit the assets we have or to derive win-win cooperation so maybe i've got energy I can sell to you, and maybe you can sell me partly finished goods or finished goods, and we can have an arrangement, and we don't have to conduct it in dollar terms, which they don't. And therefore, that's out the purview of SWIFT, so the United States can't sanction us. And of course, ironically, the Ukraine war has has exemplified that this is entirely possible because Russia has been able to function outside SWIFT. I mean, it was excluded from SWIFT. But it's been able to do it through utilizing other payment mechanisms. They obviously have MIR themselves. Chinese have SIPs. But there are a lot of other countries who very quietly have payment system where they can pay each other in local currencies. And of course, the other thing that is hugely advantageous to pay in local currencies is what happens when the US weaponizes the dollar. It destroys local currencies. That's one of the first tactics. Well, If you trade with another country in local currencies and you don't use the dollar as an intermediary or the dollar in any capacity, then that eliminates the risk of you having your currency basically destroyed and having massive inflationary pressure. And this is something the US is deeply puzzled about. For the last two years, there's been a huge pressure put in on local currencies and the emerging markets because of the relative strength of the dollar. And they're going, well, why are these countries capitulating? Well, precisely because they're operating outside the dollar system. And of course, this gives them great enthusiasm to go, well, even if our currency is wrecked in dollar terms, it doesn't actually matter if we're able to function and operate outside that system with local currencies, or perhaps it's barter where, you know, like the Iranian that barter system where They'll sell oil to a country and they'll sell finished goods to the Iranians. And they just determine the value of that transaction without having to make any reference to the dollar, which is another thing people seem to think everything has to be referenced with respect to the dollar, and it doesn't. And the other thing, of course, is that we're starting to see the global south saying, well, we can assert ourselves because we have a real economy. We actually sell goods. We actually have tangible assets. We have a workforce that actually is heavily orientated towards manufacturing and production. Okay, there's consumption. No one's disputing that. But they're going, well, we have a right to assert ourselves and we don't have an economy based on financialization, which is all increasingly we have in the West. So this is why in in reality now the BRICS countries' economy, if you A in totality, is way higher than the G7. And if you do it in purchasing parity terms, power of parity term, then it's infinitely greater again. And and this is because they actually have a real economy. And this is the thing, of course, that completely confused the West. They didn't understand that Russia has a real economy and that real economy can continue to thrive domestically just because you put sanctions on, they won't affect the internal markets. And so this has given all this credibility to the fact that de-dollarization and having multipolarity can work. And Ironically, the Ukraine war has been a blueprint for other nations to go, we can do this. And it's given nations in what I now really prefer to refer to as West Asia, which is the Middle East, the ability 
to do likewise, which is why we're seeing what people think these tectonic shifts in politics, like reproachment between the Saudis and the Iranians. I mean, I talked about it was happening for years, and people said it will never happen. Well, it has happened. And West Asia's dramatically changed its attitude and wants to embrace multipolarity, wants to embrace BRICS, wants to embrace the idea of self-determination to be able to operate outside the dollar. So in a very sort of 100,000 foot view, that's in essence the big change and nation after nation's embracing it. Some European countries to some extent are embracing it. Hungary being an example, who's defying the Brussels by continuing to want to develop relations with the Russians, but also the Chinese and also the Iranians in the process. But by and large, most of Europe is still stuck in the old paradigm and refusing to accept that this is irreversible, these changes are happening, and we need to start to understand we have to function in this world as Europe's finding to its cost that you can sanction Russian energy, fine. But as Germany's found out particularly, there is a big price to pay for that because German as an industrial powerhouse, only existed because of access to very cheap Russian energy. Once that stopped, Germany's industrial base collapsed, and it's collapsed very, very quickly. So what's the future for that? Continue to have expensive energy and gut the nation even more and cause total economic collapse? Or does it say we have to embrace multipolarity? At some point, we're going to have to go back to the Russians and hope they give us cheap energy. And Okay, that's political suicide as things stand, but I think they have to they have to start thinking about the political suicide in not doing this because if you've got a country, there's going to come a point when the people will say enough is enough and we've had enough of this. And of course that feeds in to the enormous political and economic and financial change that will have to happen in Europe if Europe and the United States and the UK, for example, wants to be able to exist or coexist in a multipolar world. Yeah, I think the point that you made about Russia and about the fact that really they have a real economy, it's resource-based, and that there is demand despite all of these sanctions is a really important one. You know, the reality of the rest of the world needing that energy and wanting to continue to develop regardless of, you know, the kind of finger-wagging arbitrary rule that has been put in place is one worth talking about more, Paul. I think this entire idea of the effectiveness of the sanctions is something that is quite interesting to me. And that's not to say that we're condoning the actions of Russia, that the conflict in any way, shape or form was a positive thing. But I think it's a real world lesson in understanding the actual implications of the need for resources and the need for energy, right? Yeah, I mean, if we look, if we fundamentally go back to the point of the start of the Ukraine war, the West, rather ignorantly, because it's almost been brainwashed by its own propaganda about what Russia is as a nation, they still think it's something stuck in the 1980s, it's communist, it's autocratic and much worse. And and because they were brainwashed by their own propaganda they feed to us, they actually forgot what Russia's real economy was like and how Russia since the Maidan in 2014 was already rotating its economy from and to do with import substitution, developing domestic markets, putting provision in place to be able to trade outside the dollar and to be cognizant of the fact that the risk is at some point the US would impose these onerous sanctions. I don't think they actually thought they would do it. But of course, they did do it because the US thought, particularly, this is a quick win. Russia will not survive. Its economy will capitulate. Its financial system will capitulate. The ruble will collapse and Putin will be overthrown and gone. And once Putin's gone, then everything will change. Multipolarity will die because the Chinese won't feel emboldened enough to continue without Russia as a as its sidekick, as it's because Russia and China are joined at the hip. And of course, that all failed. And simply because they didn't understand what the Russian people stand for. They don't understand the popularity of Putin and how the Russian nationalism in a positive sense would override everything. They saw the threat from Ukraine as existential and that the Russians had to do something. If they hadn't, 
Putin would not have been president now. That's that's the irony. And of and yes, when Russia has all these resources, because the idea they're just a gas station with nukes, well, that's not true. They also underestimated that the rest of the world by this point in the global south had had enough of US and Germany and US bullying and weren't well, this is a step too far. So, of course, that just led to the whole idea then that, well, Russia can survive. And because then, and yes, the future is going to be all about those who have resources, whether it's energy, whether it's food, whether it's commodities, and those who are able to produce energy or have access to very cheap energy, because things are going to be very energy intensive, as as has always been the case. And the basic bottom line is, Energy is the lifeblood of the world, of nations. If you don't have access to energy or affordable energy, you're in big trouble. And, you know, the United States for the now can, to some degree, supplement Europe's energy shortages, although, of course, Europe's still buying Russian energy via the back door. I mean, you have ludicrous situations where the Russians sell energy to the Chinese who then ship it halfway around the world, and Europe goes... We're sticking it to the Russians, and they're not. <laughs> because they're buying Russian energy and paying three, four, five times the cost. But the base bottom line is the US is not a long-term solution for them. The long-term solution, ironically, is the Iranians and the Russians who have enormous amounts of energy. I mean, they've probably, you know, this idea there's an energy cliff, I completely refute that. The, the Russians probably have 200 years of energy left, which could basically provide all the energy needs for the world. And the Iranians, probably something similar. The idea whether we continue using oil and gas in the future is an entirely different matter. But we don't have energy shortages. I mean, and we've seen this where there's this war between effectively OPEC plus, including the Russians and the United States, where the US wants more and more energy to be produced to keep the price down. Now, if the US is supposed to be the biggest energy producer in the world, why are they so desperate? for energy costs to be lower. Why? Because they're a net importer and they don't want to have to import energy at huge cost because they can't afford to do this. So in essence, when you start to factor all these things into the broader perspective of what's happened with Russia, the world is going, well, where are the countries with all the resources? Well, Africa has got enormous untapped resources. China's increasingly developing more and more oil and gas assets. It has a huge monopoly on rare earths, for example. And you look at the rest of the global south and other nations with resources, and all of a sudden everyone's going, well, they've got the resources or access to resources. They have you know, solid relationships built on trust. It's win-win cooperation. They don't have financialization, so they don't have bloated assets. Okay, we can talk about China and what's going on there in that regard. But predominantly, the global south doesn't have this problem. It has a young workforce, and it has a much lower cost of living matrix. Everything's much cheaper. So they're in the prime position to be able to have decades and beyond of growth. Where you look at us in the West, where's the growth? I mean, we, we've maxed out on debt. We've maxed out in terms of we can't pay people any higher salaries because We create massive inflation in the process. All we can do now is print money to plug gaps with our budget crisis. And whenever there's a problem now, no one in the world wants to buy US debt anymore. So the US has to print or fudge it in some way where some entity who apparently is a foreign entity in the Caymans who isn't a foreign entity is buying up US treasuries. But increasingly, that's getting to the point where that market's exhausted. There's no money left to buy US treasuries buy money market funds or whoever else. So then the US is left with this predicament. What do they do? They're just going to have to print and print and print until eventually it's totally unsustainable because that printed money is going to end up in the real economy, which is going to cause huge more inflationary problems. So, And this is the big difference. The future belongs to the global south because they have all the advantages of 50, 100 years of growth. Okay, if they go down the angle of financialization, they'll they'll destroy themselves, but they don't have the intention of doing that. And China's made that point very clearly in the last two or three years that the mistakes they did make with that would have to be rectified and they're starting to rectify them, even though the West thinks that means it's collapse. It isn't collapse. And we in the West have to reinvent ourselves to be able to say, how can we become 
competitive again. But look at Europe, it has no access to resources. How does Europe in the future be able to become sustainable and to have a thriving industrial base, production base, manufacturing? How is it going to be able to reinvent itself? It's a huge problem, and it's going to have to rely on the world, the nations in the world who have the resources. So at some point, whether it really sticks in their throat and they hate doing this, they're going to have to sit down with adversaries like the Iranians, the Russians, and the Chinese and go, okay, what can we do? How can we work together so we can basically put the past behind us and realize financialization is dead? It's so, and what does that mean? What does it mean for us to reinvigorate the US industrial base? And that doesn't mean the ludicrous Inflation Reduction Act that says, I know I've got an idea, let's just subsidize everything, which actually is inflationary. And uh, because without that, we don't attract any investment into the country. We have to literally beg, you know, countries to come and build a factory and give them a big subsidy so they'll do it. And then we're going to have to subsidize all the prices in the process. How who's paying for these subsidies? That's not the way to build, you know, a solid manufacturing base. Because even if you think we can focus on the US and it's an enormous country, four million square miles, the problem is that is going to create massive inflation. Because all of a sudden, instead of buying a widget from the Chinese that costs a dollar, you're going to be producing the widget yourself and it'll cost you five dollars. Well, it's self-explanatory, that's hugely inflationary and it's unsustainable because people will go, well, I need to be paid five times more to buy that widget. So they'll want much higher wages and you blow your cost of living matrix and you blow your ability to produce anything and to produce something that you can even sell to your domestic market, never mind the intention. Well, we'd like to have a trade surplus so we can sell these goods to whoever else in the world and the rest of the world's going well we're happy because the global south is going to produce this widget for a dollar maybe they'll produce the widget for 75 cents in the future as and you know china is moving its economy away from being the nation that produces the widget for a dollar so it's moving its production base to vietnam and vietnam sells the goods to the us and the us is going china's economy is collapsing and china's going no it's not we're utilizing Vietnam and it's win-win. Vietnam gets a cut of the pie, so to speak, and, and so do we. Or the other one is when the China moves a lot of its manufacturing base to Mexico or it exports goods to Mexico. And then the United States imports them from, from Mexico and is again going, we're sticking it to the Chinese and they're not because China's utilizing Mexico. I mean, the stuff that may have made in Mexico on, but it's just rebadged from China. So these are the problems we face, and it is ultimately a question of how do we change our financial economic model away from financialization and having this asset inflation where something that's worth a dollar and we're claiming it's worth a thousand dollars, because that's the only way we sustain our economy, and which is why they desperately want to keep all asset prices as high as possible. So we have to keep pumping equity markets. We have to, we have to do everything to, to pump any market that looks like asset prices are falling. Because when asset prices collapse, like bonds, look what happens. The whole banking system risks falling apart. Or you know, if asset prices fall in commercial real estate and all the financial institutions in the West with access to that, they're in serious trouble. They're going to start having huge asset impairment. Their balance sheets will blow up. And then because everything's geared around financialization, what it then means is they're insolvent. And I would argue if you priced assets correctly, that the entire Western financial system pretty much is insolvent. And you know, it's like and all the shenanigans that's gone on with regards to financialization with respect to interest rates and bond prices if you look at the interest rate swap markets there's something gone on because to raise interest rates to plus five percent you would have completely blown up the interest rate swap markets it hasn't happened so what you know financial chicanery has gone on to disguise the fact that you've got not just asset impairment in small and regional banks but the two big to fail banks as well, because either directly 
or indirectly because of all the contagion and systemic problems that exist, which is by definition inherently what financialization is. It was a, a situation where you then effectively lassoed all the major financial institutions and smaller ones together, all under the guise of, well, this is the future. This is we somehow we're going to create an economic boom from financialization and will neglect the very things the global south is wanting to do and is doing and the west is sat there going well who cares what they're doing well we're back to the point it's all about resources hence why china's buying up enormous resources and has been for years because it wants to get hold of the resources it doesn't have or, or maximize its position with the resources it does have and it's not just china it, india's done the same and Southeast Asian nations are trying to do the same. And Africa now wants to be able to say, well, we've got the resources and we'd like to develop relationships with countries who won't exploit us and destroy us with colonial, neo-colonial behaviour. And, and you know, that's the position we find ourselves in now. Yeah, it's a really important point to try to understand the difference between China at this point and the U.S., and the effect that deflation has on either of them. And I appreciate you, you know, going through that. Paul, let's focus on one of the things you mentioned is the too big to fail banks and basically the assets, quote unquote assets that they're holding. Is the commercial real estate bubble, you know, this looming idea that many have seen for a long time, it doesn't really seem to have you know, this crashing effect that many predicted. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's one of those things. It's a kind of slow burning effect. We saw it in 2023, around about a year ago, where we had, you know, for example, with bond price impairment, because obviously long maturing bonds, the, the value had been significantly decrease because of the, the rise in interest rates. So we started to see problems in the small regional banks and they immediately stepped in and tried to prevent the contagion problem spreading. Now, the reason I mentioned the re small regional banks is there's a, there's a belief, and it's with some validity, that the problem primarily exists in the small regional banks. And to some extent, that is true, but it's not entirely true because, again, it's back to this issue of contagion. Now, the question largely that is overlooked is in the West, because we always like to think shadow banking is China's problem. The United States has an enormous shadow banking problem where even the two big to fails have basically invested something like in these shadow banking by giving them loans somewhere in the order of a trillion dollars. Now, a lot of that money has then ended up being invested directly or indirectly through pension funds, et cetera, in commercial real estate. So whilst you may say they don't directly, aren't directly affected, they are indirectly affected by virtue of the fact of their investment. And of course, it comes back to this point, as, as it always does, it's a slow burning effect. You, the, you raise interest rates, it doesn't instantly have an impact. People think it's all a light switch moment again. It's a, it's a situation where commercial real estate is in serious trouble. And of course, the pandemic didn't help in that regard because a lot of people started going, we don't need all this office space. And there was even big institutions buying premises who were then selling them for a 90% loss. We were totally losing tens or hundreds of millions of dollars on these deals because no one wants commercial real estate the way they did it because there is this big change in emphasis in how people work or the idea you know of having these big grandiose office spaces no longer needed and companies don't want the added expenditure of having commercial real estate and of course there's the declining economy and the reality of of what the real economy is doing as opposed to the mythical financial data that suggests otherwise. So I think it's a question of uh, this exposure is going to start to affect not only small regional banks, it will start to affect the too big to fails because how are they going to actually increase asset prices in commercial real estate? They're not. 
and the losses that are being incurred are growing. And okay, to some extent, there's always this question, this black mark of bailing out institutions with with dubious means. And well, you can come to this window at the Fed and you can borrow money, but don't worry, we won't reveal who you are at this point in time. And we don't know who these institutions are. Okay, these windows are supposed to start closing, but there's no doubt there is a lot of bailing out gone on since 2008, even in too big to fail banks. It's not easy to prove categorically what's happened but you just know from the metrics like the same interest rate swaps that these two big to fails would have blown up because their exposure is hundreds of trillions of dollars okay you can net it out and say it's considerably less but it's still enough to blow them up so it it will it is happening and it's something that has been growing i would say in the last year or two but it, i know when i go back to understanding from my own perspective in 2006 that we were going to have a financial crisis. I don't want to call it a global one anymore because it was a Western financial crisis, but and especially related to subprime real estate. And we saw it in 2006. For me, it was crystal clear and I was going, this is going to happen. I don't know when. I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen, but it will happen in the foreseeable future, meaning we're not talking a decade away or decades, we're talking years. And of course, within around about two years or so, it happened. Well, we're starting to see clear evidence of that again. And there is starting finally to be the regulators are starting to go, hang on a minute. We're a bit concerned what this shadow banking is. I mean, I've talked about this on my own podcast for years going, this is an enormous elephant in the room that no one's looking at. Well, they're starting to look at it too little, too late. So It's just an ongoing process. I mean, they will do everything to try and prevent the the collapse of financialization. I mean, hence what they did in 2008. But the problem is, this time around, I don't think they have the capability to, to pull that off. But also, it's an everything problem now. In 2008, it wasn't. We've got... You know, just look at the the financial economic landscape of the West in 2008 compared to now. There's no comparison. It's an everything problem. Now, it's not just commercial real estate. It will be, you know, just uh, real estate in terms of what you and I buy in properties. Anything that is related to financialization of assets is an enormous problem, and the, the real economy is blowing up. I mean, inflation is still a big problem, even though they try to claim it isn't. And and in the process, you you only have to look at what's going on in the real world, in real economies, and you talk to people who are the kind of problems they're experiencing. The the dollar is in trouble. I mean, it's not going to die tomorrow or next week. It's a long-term problem, but it's, it's accelerating. And if people don't believe it, fine. But why do they think the United States provoked a war with Russia in Ukraine, which now that latest you know, New York Times article admits it. We were provoking Russia because the world, they saw that the Russians as the nation that was leading the charge to de-dollarize. And we've seen throughout history where nations want to de-dollarize, generally not very pleasant things happen. Look at what happened with Saddam Hussein in Iraq is because he wanted to de-dollarize. The same with Gaddafi in Libya. So the dollar is extremely important. And that is another facet to this ongoing problem. The West is experiencing an everything problem. And there's a thousand spinning plates. And if one of them stops spinning, the whole thing will collapse. And and it's so it's not something you can easily manage. And again, it's perception management. If the United States is seen in the future to bail everything out, I mean, how much is it going to cost to bail everything out? Again, trillions of dollars. That will be the end of the dollar because the the world will go, we can't trust you. You We absolutely can't trust you anymore. It's very obvious that all you're doing is printing money to plug gaps. Your credibility is gone. The dollar isn't a safe haven, and it isn't regarded as that anymore to the extent it once was. And U.S. Treasury markets are totally illiquid, and they're not a safe haven either. And that will just accelerate that problem. So there isn't a solution to this. But... It's like anything, they will desperately do everything to preserve the dollar, to preserve US hegemony, to try and preserve financialization, because ultimately you can rig numbers to mean anything. 
But fundamentally, we're at a, a turning point now where they don't have any solutions. They don't have any answers to anything. But the reason they raised interest rates had nothing to do with inflation. It was to try and preserve the dollar. They thought if we hike interest rates, the dollar will become extremely strong against emerging markets. We think we can cripple the ruble in the process, will cripple the yuan, which they people seem to think is happening and it isn't. But we'll cripple them and then the world will be begging us for dollars. They'll all come rushing back going, we need dollars. And that's not happened. It's totally failed. The US can't grasp, as I said earlier, why this is happening. Well, it's happening because nations are not wanting to be part of the US dollar, US treasury matrix anymore. But this is why it's all about dollar preservation. And in the process, they can wreck the real US economy by hiking interest rates, but they don't think that matters because, oh, it'll just create a recession. It might be a hard landing, but as long as the financial system survives, as long as financialization of assets is maintained, we can keep this idiotic economic financial model going. Well, you can't because the real economy is being destroyed. And that's partly because of enormous inflationary pressure caused during the pandemic. It's not entirely, it's just an ongoing failure of policy in terms of fiscal and monetary policy since 2008. So (laughs) we've got a long way around to answer your question, but it's just a process. You know, it's not something where, oh, there's a problem and two minutes later it blows up. I, you know, 2008 was in was really happening from 2005, I would say, onwards. That was three years, and that's just one small but very significant isolated problem. This time around, there's multiple problems. They're all a problem. None of them can be resolved, and they're all interwoven. And you know, I tried to use that analogy. There's like a billion pieces of string all interwoven. Now, it's extremely complicated. No one has a clue how to resolve it, and no one knows what pulling one piece of string out might do in a broad, broader context. But, you know, the commercial real estate sector is a big problem, but it's one of many big problems, which ultimately comes back to the fact you can't price assets at, uh, and keep inflating them and not end up suffering consequences for it. And that's sadly where the West is. But, you know, they've had a good run, I guess, because financialization started in the 80s. So, It blew up in 2008, so now magically they've kept it going for basically 15 years since. But but the wheels have completely fallen off now, and it's just a matter of time before they can't deny reality. And the reality is what's killing the real economy. And I think I mentioned on this previously where the Dow could be 50,000, and most Americans are destitute. Well, I mean, you can argue that's – kind of what's happened to some extent in Venezuela with their equity markets. But I'm trying to make the point in a broader set, this is what financialization does. All the metrics say one thing, but the real economy says something quite different. Yeah, I think that's a very important point, is that the reality is a lot different from the world that you want. But Paul, I'd like to drill in a little bit more on what evidence or what actual symptoms that we're starting to see crop up that are raising alarm bells of a next or another looming financial crisis here? Well, I mean, we've had some taste of this. We you know, we don't need to go back in detail to do with what's happening with the bond markets and what happened with small regional banks. That was one example of this. Then there was, obviously, we talked about commercial real estate. So we're obviously seeing symptoms of enormous exploding debt, whether it's, you know, in private sector, whether it's, you know, in commercial sector, we're seeing clear evidence of businesses who are really technically insolvent, but for some reason, they've not been declared to be insolvent. We're certainly seeing evidence that, and Europe's a great example of this, where deindustrialization is happening. And we're seeing clear evidence they're replacing, and this is in the US as well, where you know they're replacing what you might call well-paid full-time jobs with part-time jobs that pay minimum wage or really poorly. And of course, they're manipulating data going, we've created four jobs, and that four jobs equivalent maybe to one you might call proper full-time employment in a job that you know someone can actually earn a wage and afford to live. 
And of course, the idea that all this economic problems doesn't feed into the financial system is simply not true. If they're, they're totally interlinked. We can't divorce one from the other. That's one of the big failings of financialization that somehow we could divorce them and they would never intertwine anyway and we keep one going whilst the other is completely failing. So the other point I think worth making about this is just look at the rising in the United States, the budget deficit and the trade deficit. I mean, the budget deficit particularly is totally unsustainable. It can't be financed. And if you were to actually stop financing it, the United States would collapse. And what is it financing? Think of all the institutions that it has to finance in the process. What would it mean for the US if they stopped financing? I'm not talking about the military industrial complex. I mean, you know, we're talking about just the general day-to-day functions of, of what a government should do. And it's the same in the West. There's, there's all this subsidies. There's, you know, they're claiming, well, there isn't a problem with energy, but if you take the subsidies out, people couldn't afford to live. They, you know, I mean, the Netherlands is a great example of subsidizing everything and creating the illusion that everything's fine, but if you strip that out, everything would collapse. So, you know, this is an enormous problem in of itself as well. So I think there are just so many factors that are ongoing. There's also the issue of the fact that the West is now starting to have to deal with this fact that it's not going to be able to have access to resources through exploitation. And France is a great example. Its economy is going to be in serious trouble because it was basically stealing everything out of Africa and subsidizing its own economy financial system. Well, like, That's not going to happen. And if the dollar continues to get rejected, which it is, that's going to have a serious impact on the US itself in the process as well. So there are just many of these factors and they're all ongoing. I mean, I talk about the collapse of US to Germany and the US dollar. I should probably phrase it better. It doesn't mean it's the end of the dollar per se. What it means is as a world reserve currency, it is, and that has a huge impact on the US itself, but it is just this decline in living standards. It's people don't have disposable income, they're having to live, not even paycheck to paycheck. That's why people's credit card balances are going through the roof because they're having to finance basic living with credit, or however they can get hold of credit. But eventually they max out on everything. They're not gonna have any money to pay for anything. Therefore, the argument is if this starts to impact economies in a major way, then businesses will go to the wall. We've seen big German companies go into the wall. What does that, what's the impact in the broader sense on the financial system? Because who's invested in these companies? Is it pension funds? Is it direct investment? What's the broader implication of this? What does people losing their jobs mean? And if it happens on a whole scale level, well, I mean, these people are going to have to to be able to afford to survive. So what are you going to do? Just give them endless bailouts and pay them so they're, they're not destitute? Because if you make tens of millions of people destitute in the United States or millions in the Netherlands or in Germany, the risk is there's going to be civil unrest. So they can't allow that to happen either. But then, I mean, the Netherlands is a great example. They're going, we can't afford to keep subsidising everyone, but if we stop... The risk is we'll have millions of people destitute and then they'll rise up and refuse to accept you know what's happening to them so again there's no answer to to resolve these problems and it's just this endless manifestation of the cause and effect if you wreck the financial system and you try to have qe zero interest rate policy for over a decade and it's a complete failure because it doesn't generate any economic growth. It's just asset price inflation. And people say there's no inflation. Well, that's where all the inflation did exist. It's now not in there. And if you blow your budget, that money's going to be spent in the real economy. It will create inflationary pressure. People seem to think printing money doesn't have inflationary consequences. Of course it does. And this is why we've had what we had because of pandemic policy. So in the end, any way you resolve these problems, you have to revert GDP to this true mean. You have to curb spending, which you can't do. But if you actually did everything you should do to try and resolve the problems, 
you would blow. There would be nothing left. I literally, we would have no economy. Your financial system would be wrecked and destroyed, and they can't allow that to happen. But in trying to prevent that happening, all they're doing is accelerating and making problems worse and, and wrecking the real economy. And you know, I get countless people saying, well, real inflation, I'm paying this for these goods. 12 months ago, it was 20% less. And we know they fudge financial data. We know they fudge CPI and it's meaningless because it doesn't bear any resemblance to the reality of what people are paying for goods and services. And, and that's across the whole of the West. And this is irrefutably the case. And, and I've noticed this to a large extent where we are in, in Europe. It's been prevalent. Okay, they're now in some sense is trying to start to reduce prices of goods in shops. And there has been some effect to that extent, but that is largely brought about by, by the fact that the reason they're getting some reduction in inflation is because people's spending capability has been massively curtailed. People can't afford to pay things, pay for anything anymore. And, you know, they're living hand to mouth. I mean, that is often largely the case in the Netherlands where people get mortgages subsidized, they get 50% of their interest repaid. They didn't have all these subsidies. They couldn't manage. And these are people earning decent money or in inverted commas, okay, decent money, what does it mean in reality? But that's the predicament they're facing. And, you know, it comes back to the point, the only way a country can function is to have cheap energy, access to cheap resources, access to cheap food, and anything that in, in any way is the, is the building blocks of your economy. As soon as you don't have access to that, it's over. And you, know, and you can keep trying to fake reality. You can keep trying to fudge financial data or economic data and try to convince yourself to the contrary. But ultimately, that's precisely what Weimar Germany did. And in the end, look what's happened with Weimar Germany. It just completely imploded. And they kept printing money, pretending printing money wasn't a problem. And yeah, you could spend it in, in the real economy and there were no consequences. Well, we're at that point where... The United States particularly is totally unsustainable. And when no one can buy U.S. debt anymore or no one wants to buy U.S. debt, the Fed is going to have to print it all. And when the Fed prints it all, that's when, you know, the proverbial all hell will break loose at the moment. It's not entirely the case, but when that day happens and if it should happen, for me, that's going to be the end of the end game. That's when everything will completely unravel. Because the world will know the Fed is monetizing everything and it will cause huge problems internationally with the credibility of the dollar, the credibility of the United States, because people go, well, you're just you're just like Zimbabwe. That's all you do now is printing. And of course, printing will have massive ramifications for the economy and the financial system in the process. So, Paul, we've seen a contrast really between, let's say, the behavior of the West and especially the U.S., as as you've been detailing here, with the amount of printing, the hyper-financialization of all of these markets, the constant lowering of interest rates, versus the East that has seemed to exert some fiscal discipline to get that, you know, certain bubbles under control. And I think the other big part is that the East really has been buying gold hand over fist. Is this basically a marker of the way that the world is heading and flows of the big money in a way talking their book and showing the rest of the world the way that they're headed and showing that gold ends up being the answer in this very risky time when we have all of these looming issues of financialization. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a point worth making with gold. I mean, and it was something that I kind of think about from time to time. And I read a tweet by Simon Mihailovich, who made the point that gold is wealth. And it absolutely, that's it in a nutshell. It's something that's not very well understood. And mm -hmm. we absolutely know that there's been this enormous transfer of gold from West to East. I made the point previously in 2012 for two and a half years, a thousand metric tons. So 30,000 in total went from the West from various locations to China and Hong Kong. And to varying degrees, this is carried on not to that level of intensity, but there's huge amounts of gold heading East and nations 
are buying gold hand over fist because they know what's coming. They understand that when it really matters, you have to preserve wealth. And gold will be some component in the future. Now, there's a whole bunch of arguments. What does that mean? And this ties in with the idea of a BRICS currency that may be partially backed by gold or might be backed by commodities or might not be backed by any of those. But the idea that gold will be a fundamental component in the future, I mean, the Russians kind of alluded to it. The Chinese, once some senior Politburo member in Beijing came out with a very one-line statement going, gold will be an important component of the financial system in the future. It didn't say anything else. No one questioned what did this mean. But yes, gold is an extremely important component. And hence why you know it comes to the point of China. China has what it officially tells everyone. It has about 2,400 tonnes. But I've made this point before. China has about 40,000 tonnes of gold because alone for decades, it's manufactured 600 metric tonnes a year that never leaves China. Well, just do the maths. In a decade, that's 6,000 tonnes. So the idea and the idea that you know, China has this very relatively small amount of gold is an illusion. I mean, China's reserves in terms of gold, silver, etc., is a matter of national security and it's secret. Nobody knows in reality, what the exact figure is. But they've certainly at least publicly started to tell people in recent, the last year or so, every month, we're buying gold. And very clearly, this is to protect and insulate themselves to some degree from its exposure to the dollar and the exposure to the US treasuries. People are saying they're buying it because the yuan's collapsing. This is just mythical Western nonsense. They love to believe that China's always collapsing. It's been a statement I've heard for 20 years, and it's farcical. They're not buying it because the yuan's collapsing. They're buying it because they don't trust or believe in the US dollar, US treasury complex. And it's the same for all the other nations buying them. We've seen nations like Poland buying it, and Hungary and certain nations in the West that have been buying because they understand why it's imperative at this point in time to make sure that you do have gold because gold is wealth. And in a general sense, it's a good point to mention with regards to China. And China did adopt some idiotic Western policies and allowed what you might call financialization of assets in commercial real estate and in real estate. But the Chinese, probably six years ago or so, turned around and she made the point, a house is for living in, it's not an investment. And they started to then realize we have to address these bubbles and we'll start to allow these bubbles to deflate. I mean, they put policies in place which eventually led to the demise of Evergrande. This was always going to happen. The West saw this as, oh, China's collapsing and it's, well, it's not collapsing. It is deflating these bubbles. Okay, it doesn't mean they can achieve all those objectives, but they're starting to recognize where financialization has been a complete failure. But they, contrary to conventional Western wisdom, the one thing they and other countries need to do, they don't print huge amounts of money. This is not true. They don't have financialization of all their economy. So look at the Chinese bond market, look at their 10-year. It functions like a normal bond market, not like the West, where it's very clear the bond markets are completely volatile, they're illiquid, and they are no longer a safe haven. The Chinese bond market functions far more normally because they don't have financialization. China has a real economy. That's why it has this enormous trade surplus every year. And in fact, the West's finally woken up to something interesting, where they're actually realizing that in 2023, China's actual uh, tra trade surplus was three times higher than what they claimed. And why is China not tell the truth about its gold reserves? Why is China hiding all these facts? Because it wants its currency to be weaker. Because it's advantageous. <laughs> because it is a has a trade surplus, it wants its, its currency, sorry, weaker. And it will trade it within a range. And currently it's in the, the top end of the range that China wants the yuan to be. So if the yuan starts to weaken too much, they'll take necessary measures to strengthen it a bit. So if the currency becomes too strong, they tell the state-owned banks, dump yuan and buy dollars, or dump 
dollars and buy you out. And to keep the currency in the ratio, they are manipulating the currency, but more manipulating the currency by not telling the truth about its gold reserves, about its real economy. And because, you know, again, people will say this is just I'm a Beijing apologist. I'm not. The, the data exists and there are people even in the Council of Foreign Relations now who are unearthing this data going, China's been under egging its economy. It's un, you know, it's not telling the truth. And and they aren't telling the truth. There'll come a point when China will want a stronger yuan for sure. But at the moment, it doesn't want it. And why would it want to? Because it's benefiting from weakening it. But fundamentally, yeah, China has the problems China has is not anything the West ever imagined. Demographics is not a problem for China. China's uh, general economy is fine. I mean, it had growth of 5.2%. The argument, again, from Western data now is that China's economy grew more than that. But fundamentally, China is not collapsing. If China is collapsing economically, why is its growth twice that of the United States in 2023? And bear in mind, China's economy is not built around financialization. It's built around largely manufacturing and production. And of course, it has its overseas investment where it invests, but again, that's in productive capacity. But it's fundamentally a very different economy, as we know from the West. So when you look at that as an example, vis-a-vis compared to what happens in the West, and the realization that nations want to get out the dollar, they don't want to, to to have the dollar as a currency for international trade anymore, They want to be in a situation where they can, as we say, come back to the point of exploiting their own asset and to be able to work in conjunction. Then the East is radically different. And this is why the West doesn't see gold as, uh, why do we need gold? We, We have to have financialization. Fiat has to reign supreme because when fiat's gone, we're dead because our our experiment's gone. If we have to live within our means, and I'm not advocating we go back to a gold standard, and I don't think we will have a gold standard the way people think. That's the other problem you mentioned, back in currency of gold. They go, but you can't have a gold standard. Well, who's saying it's a gold standard? But if China, for argument's sake, was to back the UN with gold, it would give massive confidence to utilise that currency in international trade. I mean, think about how much investment would suddenly move back into China if they were to do that, the currency. And the other point about foreign direct investment and everyone's going, it's collapsed in China. The only thing it's collapsed in is people investing in China's stock market. If you look at foreign direct investment in real things, that's growing year over year. So China doesn't care particularly if its equity markets fall 10 20%, because Its economy doesn't depend on it. Okay, there's an argument it's going to have some impact and you can't just totally ignore it. But a lot of this was just Westerners pulling money out of China. Partly it was political, but partly because they're trying to plug gaps back at home because they've now got financial difficulties themselves. They have margin calls, they have issues where they're having to to raise finance. And if you sell equities, that's one way of doing it. So it's not this clear-cut idea that, Everything's collapsing in China, but it's rather like the idea of the Russian economy is a complete basket case. Russia has no net debt. Russia's economy, despite sanctions, grew at 3.6% last year. Russia's economy is going through this massive rotation, as is China, where China is moving away from being the breadbasket of cheap crap, as I'd like to call it, for the rest of the world. And it's going, well, we increasingly don't want to do it. We want to move to more high-tech sectors, which it's doing, and it's starting to take a lead in those. But the fundamental point that terrifies Beijing is the people are demanding better standard of living, access to better quality goods. And if they don't deliver on it, the Chinese government's toast. And then the people aren't unreasonable, but they have expectations. That's the thing that keeps Beijing government awake at night. Can we meet the needs of the people? Now, if you, the average person in the West would tell you this is a lie, but it isn't. Because again, China is not what people in the West imagine it to be. So it has challenges and it will have to keep growing. And at some point in the future, as China becomes more consumption-based, that's why it's trying to buy up assets in the world and rotate its economy. It's going to have challenges. No one's disputing that. But the challenges the West claims it's having is just this work of fiction because everybody thinks the only way the economies can work is how we do it. It has to be financialization. 
and the East is working on the basis of sound money, of backing currencies with commodities, of, of having tangible assets, to have real wealth, to be able to have wealth generation. So I take a, a dollar, I make a dollar twenty. I don't take a dollar and it ends up worth a cent and there's nothing to show for it. So that's the big fundamental shift that's also happening in the West predominantly is not alert to this big change and why it needs to start to understand that it has to make fundamental changes. And those fundamental changes will include adopting a very different attitude and not thinking, well, another trade war with China will resolve the problems because the trade war for the United States was a complete disaster. They should never have implemented it. We said so at the time, and it looks like Trump, if he gets elected, which he probably will, assuming he's a Republican candidate, which he probably will be. He's all hell-bent on tariffing China into oblivion, as he thinks. But all he's doing is creating price inflation in the US, and it doesn't remotely affect China. And China is rotating its economy away from the West anyway. It's moving a lot of its economy towards the Asian nations, hence why you've seen this big increase in trade with those countries and Africa, et cetera, and less trade with Western nations. Okay, it's partly because economies in the West are also under duress and therefore there's less imports. So it looks like China's exporting less. And it, But it's not because anyone's sticking it to the Chinese. It's because as well that the West is in serious trouble economically, as we know. So there is there's these two worlds at the moment that coexist, but multipolar world's growing and growing because it's based on solid fundamentals. Okay, it's got problems. It has challenges. It's not perfect. No one's saying it. And, you know, people think it's some utopian existence. It's not. But it is making huge strides forward and trying to do things in a way that's beneficial to everyone and to do it in an equitable way. The people in the West think, well, you can't do that. It's dog-eat-dog. You're either with us or against us. It's zero-sum game mentality. But the hemisphere of unipolarity is diminishing. Its influence in the world is diminishing, but also it's diminishing because of its reckless fiscal and monetary policy and what it's doing to the real economy. And no nation in the West is going to be exempt or you know, can insulate itself from what's coming. I hope you like part one of my discussion with Paul. Join us tomorrow for part two, where we get into more of his geopolitical views, views on war versus special military operations, his take on the Putin and Tucker Carlson interview, Western biases, and some of his concluding thoughts. Join us for part two tomorrow. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.